and I'm delighted to have uh, Steve Papa here. And Steve was uh, literally at this juncture some uh, decade or plus ago with his company in Decca. So Steve, please come on up and jump in and grab the stage here and tell us your story and how it played out for you. Welcome, Steve. Thank you, Thank you everybody. So just, um, I'll just do a quick, few quick slides on you know, what Indeca was, it was a software company. Um, the big idea was trying to make search much better. I'm not going to bore you with what our product was. You're all using it every day, whether you realize it or not. It's out there all over the web. Um, you know, it kind of made it easier for people to interact with products was kind of the initial idea, but then we ended up solving business intelligence problems for the world's largest organizations like IBM, which became our largest customer. We solved their thorniest problems, even though they're the world's largest business intelligence software company and services provider for business intelligence. Anyway, so, um, and then the ultimate conclusion was great, right? So in the end, we got a big number, the sixth largest acquisition ever by Oracle when it was announced, although it's been eclipsed since then. But um, the, um, and it actually, you know, this is a deal like any other, which was uh, 60 days from first call to announcement. Okay, so very quick, you know, you got a deal done. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about our difficult fundraising earlier in our uh, in a life cycle, which formed the behaviors, which is why I got that deal done in 60 days and didn't want the world to change before I could get it done. Okay. So um, the company was started just uh, a few hundred yards from here, over in Hamilton Hall. And in fact, uh, there's the first version of our product in my dorm room at uh, Hamilton. That's the, you know, version 0 001 of our database that Oracle ended up buying. So with that in mind, how many people here were in, the, in their professional careers in 99? Show of hands. There's a few. And so everyone, kind of, those folks with their hands raised knows, know how crazy it was then, right? And this chart kind of exemplifies why it was so crazy. So venture capital as an industry, you know, kind of four to five billion a year being put into funds, right? Which are, you know, which is, you know, it means about that much being put to work on a steady state all the way to you know, over 100 billion in 2000, okay? So what that means is lots of money's being shoved out there in series A's, right? So that makes it pretty easy, right? In fact, when we were founded, it was there. It took me three days to get the original angel financing. Actually had several venture firms. Actually, um, one of my uh, professors over at school ultimately uh, invested as the third one in that angel round. And um, by the end of the year, we had a great you know, uh, Series A uh, financing, and um, we were off to the races. So um, getting to that first customer was really easy. You know, <coughs> e you know, even though we were a basic research project, actually this is an important point, we got funding to do something that should have been built in a university and then spun out. But because it was the bubble, we could assemble a team of scientists and we got funding to do it. And we're going to come back to that why it's so important. Macroeconomics matters so much in terms of what you can do at any given point in time. The, um, we got lucky bringing the right scientists together. The, uh, like I said, the funding was easy. We got a set of highly credible venture capitalists and individuals. Right? That both of those were very important. And then the first customer was a six-week sales cycle in the summer of 2000. Right? So think of all of you guys trying to find customers. of a several hundred thousand dollar customer, very conservative financial services company. Okay? So, and we were conservative, so we focused on getting them live for the next six months. We didn't want to get five customers. We wanted to do it the right way, right? We're going to get that customer, make them successful, prove it out, and then scale. So in December of 2000, we start looking for customer number two, okay? We get to talk to a lot of people. By, December, by January 2001, all those people were fired. So the world had changed. Basically, it was a, you know, all these internet groups looking to do new things were gone. So we were trying to find customer number two. Um, unfortunately, while we're looking for customer number two, we're on the other side of this macro private equity situation or, or venture situation more specifically. What you'll see is, you know, the amount of capital raised, you know, declined to about a third. So that means all those companies that were funded the year before. Now, I mean, they're, you know, and a lot of stuff Michael talked about was sort of this idea of 18 months. Then, I mean, the different set of rules people were operating under. So everyone's looking for capital. So if you thought those thousands of business plans were tough, try standing out when everyone's trying to you know, triage their own portfolio and you're trying to find capital, right? And, all, and your existing investors, right? They can't, they're really reticent to, to lead an internal round because they don't want to set price. It sets problems with their limited partners. There's a whole set of cascading things. 
So you're kind of out on your own, okay? Uh, that doesn't mean we didn't get help and introductions. I mean, I spoke to just about every venture firm, you know, that I could identify um, over the course of nine months, right? And, um, you know, um, the other challenge that was happening while we, we were needing funding, um, originally I had a, a goal of finding some customers that were going to help us fund this and stretch our runway. Okay, but this was the first year over year decline in IT spending ever. Okay, so this is an industry for 40 years. Spending's going up and up. New companies, oh, I got discretionary money to spend on new things. All of a sudden, it declined. So all the discretionary stuff was gone. And this was one of my, you know, one of the quotes that was very painful. I'd, I'd run into people and say, I spent $8 million last year trying to solve this problem. It didn't work, but you solve it. But I don't have any money to spend with you. Okay, so very painful. Okay, we built a great product, great technology, yet the world had changed. Like the rug had been pulled out from under us. Um, the initial inspiration for our technology was solving a business problem in e-commerce. And this goes to one of the things about the investment community. It swings like a pendulum, right? And it's not always rational, okay? So for instance, in 2001, what we were told, e-commerce was dead. Can't make any money in e-commerce software. And we all know how laughable that is, but that's what I dealt with talking to person after person, okay? So the good news is, while we were out pounding the pavement, right, who wants to be customer number two of a venture-backed software company, right, a year later from the first customer, and they're going to run out of cash in a few months, right? So not an easy set of circumstances. But we talked to lots of people. Okay, we had a few value-added angel investors that were great. One was a chief investment officer at another financial services company that kind of, um, you know, told his team, find a way to use this stuff. And so I think they had gotten tired of those demands over time. And so by the time we got to them, they're like, we have this problem over here, which, you know, which is incredibly difficult and none of us want to touch. Throw it to them. <laughs> so, but we embraced it. We solved that problem and we expanded our vision to be a platform company. So we no longer were just e-commerce, right? So we satisfied the main objection there. Um, you know, and, but we still couldn't get commitment. Uh, fortunately, in parallel, we were you know, doing what we could to build an experienced team which was very important, even more important than normal times because the pendulum swung from late 90s, experience wasn't important. In fact, it was a bonus to have less experience, you know, almost, right? It's a new world, people are thinking differently. Pendulum swings, it's a good thing we, you know, had built a very strong team with lots of experience, you know, during 2001. Um, so, the, um, you know, like I was saying, we're gonna, we're gonna go through a, a few, um, a few events that took place. We're speaking to every firm out there. As of August 1st, we have cash for another 10 weeks, okay? And so finally, after all that searching, we get a term sheet. And it's from what I'd call a bottom feeder. This was someone that the proposal wouldn't have been worth pursuing. I would have taken it so people would have had jobs, but I wouldn't have stayed much longer, right? Because it just, you gotta have incentives. People gotta have incentives to build a business. And if someone wipes out everyone, Where's the incentive? You might as well start a new one. It's just a job at that point, okay? Um, and the better venture firms recognize that. Everyone's gotta be successful in it, okay? But by getting that first term sheet, suddenly the insiders had something to work with. They could, be, they could say to their partners, look, we've got an external pricing. It's gonna destroy the company. Let's do better than that so we can save it. But at least, you know, and it was, it was a down round that the insiders were proposing, but it was something that was bearable. Now, whether it would have remained bearable over the life cycle of the company, that's a hard question to answer, but it was a start. But that put in motion, we, there was another firm that in the background we'd stayed in touch with that had known a lot of members of the management team and um, had some success with the investors and members of the management team. I described them as the last venture firm on the planet that decided to get into tech, okay? So it's 2001 and for whatever reason they decided, we should get into tech, right? And we were lucky, we found that firm. That was the first bit of luck, okay? The second bit of luck, and I wanna emphasize this word luck because especially in difficult times, anyone that's successful, it, 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 there's, 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 there's some amount of luck that happened to them and, they sh and you, know, you shouldn't believe them if they say otherwise, right? In good times, the luck is the good times or you know, the wind's you know, in your back, right? So while they were, so as we we're trying to find additional customers that year, Right, we build up about 10 interested parties. Right? So these are prospects, and I'm, I can't remember what weasel language we used to describe them, but it would have been something like, 
you know, people working with us or some, some you know, choice language that is ambiguous, but not customers because they weren't. But um, we're talking to all these potential investors, right? And they want to speak to references because we haven't had a second customer, right? They want to get an idea of what's going on, right? And you can't have a prospective customer talk to 20 investors. That's going to kill their confidence, right? You know, I mean, so, so you have to ration these very carefully, okay? And um, so of the 10, any given prospective investor may have gotten three names. And even that, we were very careful, okay? So this firm, we gave three names to. And uh, as luck would have it, one of the partners at this firm lived next door to one of the executives at a company called Arrow Electronics. So Arrow Electronics was one of the companies that was very interested in what we were doing. In fact, they were trying to solve a problem with their IBM mainframe that we were able to build a demo for that just crushed it, right? It just was so much better. And so they're having like, you know, probably talking over the fence or maybe it's a barbecue. I mean, I imagine it something like that. And somehow the name Endeka comes up. And the guy from Arrow is like, oh, that stuff is fantastic. And so here the partner at this firm thinks, wow, I just found some proprietary diligence, right? That really gets me, you know, this is, gonna, this is the real deal. Because otherwise, if you're an investor, you're always skeptical of the names that someone's provided to you. Just like when you're, you know, you have employee, uh, someone you're interviewing, their references, you got to be skeptical. You always got to find your, um, your um, proprietary sources for those, okay? So we got lucky there, huge luck. So over the uh, Labor Day weekend, as of August 21st, we got that insider term sheet, right? It was going to close on September 7th. So that's much better than the bottom feeder. But then this other firm comes in, right, on the 30th of August and works with me over Labor Day weekend to come up with a term sheet that we could present at our board meeting on uh, September, I don't know, let's say 2nd, I think it was, or 3rd. And um, th that board meeting was originally intended to ratify the insider term sheet. Right, we'd already started working with lawyers, okay? Um, you know, I'd made clear to my investors, I was still talking to others because I'd like to do better, but suddenly I had that other term sheet. So we had a decision as a board. Do we go with the term sheet that's going to close that Friday, right, which was, I think, the 7th, okay? Or do we go with the term sheet that's going to close a week later on September 14th, okay? So a lot of, a lot of discussion around it, and, and a lot of the discussion is around, are they a good partner, right? Are these people that have, you know, are they, you know, um, good ethics? Is it people we want to work with? A lot of stuff Michael was talking about. It's a marriage. It's not a, you know, it's, it's something, you know, as the entrepreneur, you know, keep in mind, these are the people that can fire you, right? They can, you know, cause a lot of pain on what you're trying to build. So you want to make sure you have compatible, you know, views of the world. Um, and, but that ethics piece, like, are these the type of people that are going to stand by you in tough times? Okay. That's something I would really emphasize. So, um, the following week, what happens? 9-11, okay? We're right in the middle of this, okay? And yes, there's a lot of horrible things going on, but we have our own little micro problem to deal with, which is I've got five, six weeks of cash, right? And then people are out of jobs, okay? You know, and so, you know, thoughts crossing the mind. Do you, um, do you cut everyone's salary to minimum wage so you can keep benefits and stretch it out longer? Because you're going to need time because, you know, all bets are off. I mean, there's a, there's a term of art called force majeure, right? Act of God. Okay, and that's basically in a lot of deals, that's the first thing people did. You know, a lot of backers, they just pulled the ripcord. Look, I'm not doing anything. There's too much uncertainty in this world, okay? So to the credit of this firm, Ampersand Ventures, they, um, they convened a partner meeting, and they said, nothing about this company has changed as a result of 9-11. So they said, we're going to do the deal. And one of the partners was stranded in Minneapolis. If you remember, the planes weren't flying, okay? Got a rental car, drove back to Boston. We got the deal done the following week on the Wednesday. We lost three business days. I mean, that's insane, right? But that's why it's so important to pick the right partner. You know? And so it's so important for you to check the references on the partners that you're working with, right? And there's some of your, you gotta cultivate some of your proprietary references, not just what someone's providing to you, okay? So the, um, let's see, so some of the lessons, right? So we can bring this to a close. Macroeconomics, matter more than almost anything else in all of this stuff. If it's a very favorable environment, it's going to be a lot easier and you're going to have so much more negotiating leverage. If it's a terrible environment, I mean, you know, we could, we could make you a ninja at fundraising, but the, 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 if you were to build the, uh, you know, the model, the statistical model, the variable around the economy is going to have more of an influence on the outcome than anything else. So 
The next thing is fundraising starts long before you're pitching to your investors, you know, whether that's building your team. A lot, Michael talked about a lot of this, whether it's the relationships. The reason why I was able to get my first seed financing in two or three days is because there was cultivated relationships over prior months. Sometimes you, I mean, I also raised 25 million in five weeks from first meeting and never meeting someone before. So it depends on the environment. You can go both ways, okay? Um, get any term sheet and never stop looking for options until the round is done. Okay, even one that might be squishy, my personal belief is it's something that you can work with, right? It sort of puts others on notice. You know what, something's gonna happen and, you, and it gives you something that you can manage to, to get to, a, to, a, to an outcome. The next thing is in venture, it's a multi-play game. Relationships matter for the long term. So this is the condensed version of the presentation. I could talk a lot about some of the um, negotiations and you know, horse trading with some of our existing investors that got us all to a happy place as we went through you know, some of these difficult times. Um, so you don't want to sort of take your funding raising event as it's, it's this one time, you're going to use whatever leverage you've got to get the best possible deal. You want to try to do what's a, a fair deal, okay, in the context of the macro environment that, you in, that you're in. And you know, hopefully, if you picked a good partner, they'll return that favor when times are tough, okay? The, um, we already covered this. Um, luck is not optional, okay? So just to be very clear, you know, you can have a great plan, be very capable, but if you don't have luck on your side, it's, and it's not going to get done. You don't, you don't be too hard on yourself, but you've got to cultivate luck. So it, you know, it doesn't just happen, right? You've got to do things. Like if I wasn't pounding the pavement, talking to all those prospective customers, I wouldn't have cultivated that luck, okay? So um, the last one is once you agree on a deal, get it done before the world changes. Okay, and we're all products of our environment. Okay, and having gone through 2001, having gone through 2008, 2009, okay, in fact, um, you know, to, to close this out, when we were in, in 2011, when we received an offer from a large company to acquire Indeca, at first we were ignoring it because we just released tons of R&D. We're very excited about where it's going, and you know, it's like just keep going, but. In early August, the U.S. lost its AAA status. Actually, it was very coincident around when we got the first offer. U.S. lost its AAA status, right, the Treasury bonds, and Europe, it was a one in four chance Europe could cause another 2008, 2009. And after having gone through that twice, there was no way I was going through another one of those with a thinly capitalized company. I mean, those are tough things to deal with, okay? And so it was how fast can we make something happen? So we didn't hire a banker. We just, you know, we called up the people that we knew that, you know, were, were you know, fairly sizable acquisition, so it sets to a small number of folks. Called up Oracle. They'd always told me if we're going to disappear to give them a call. I said, look, we're gonna, we might be disappearing. I understand if you don't want to waste time on the deal. And uh, two days later, had the sort of pitch of our lives, pitching to the senior executive over the phone at Oracle. We kind of knew we had nothing to lose, so we just punched him in the nose. We called this baby ugly in some cases, you know, in a sense that how we could help what, you know, complement their product line. And you know what? He recognized we were bringing database technology to the world of search. Within 10 days, we had a letter of intent. And um, we just raced to get through diligence and paperwork, you know, just cut through all the red tape we could to get it announced. So two months, so 60 days is kind of a record for that size transaction, no banker, et cetera. It's a product of experience that when you have a deal on a table, get it done. So with that, I'll, uh, Hang on this for a second. So thank you very much, Steve. I'm sure all of you feel like you're actually living that experience the way you just described it. And, it's, and it sounded tiring, frankly. So I'd love to encourage questions from the audience. But before um, uh, we do, just so everybody can start thinking of them for, for Steve here. And by the way, we started about 15 minutes late. So we're just going to give you a chance to, to, to jump in here. You know, right at the beginning, if you can go all the way back there, what, what made you decide to do an, an A rather than a seed? And you, and you mentioned, you know, this thing should have been funded in the university. So say more a little bit about that, because well, we have well, a lot of people here thinking through yeah, it. Yeah, and I rushed through it. But the reality is we had used actually a convertible debt note in the summer of, 2000, of 1999, yep. which raised about a million and a half. And then we raised a Series A, which really was the B. I mean, it's yeah. the terminology is, you know, you can pick whatever letters you want. but. Um, that closed in that spring. Right. So the first thing was around a million and a half to two, and then we closed a, an $8 million round in the spring. And right. then in the fall of 2001, 
we closed, we did a first close of, I think something like 12 million, because we wanted to get money in. And there were a few others that needed more diligence. You know, we did a second close to, to finish it up. Makes tons of sense. So questions for Steve. Hi there, that was very inspirational and, and nerve wracking just he hearing you go through the process. I wanted to actually rewind to kind of pre-99, you had entered business school. Uh -huh. I'm in grad school right now as well. Um, wh what was kind of, can you talk about the ideation kind of process, what you were thinking, kind of your technical background? I know you made some hires that were sure. significant throughout the process. So I'll give you just 30 seconds of my background. I studied operations research in undergrad. Um, didn't, I mean, didn't know anything about the world of consult consulting and banks, which was fortunate, because I went and worked for a old line company, NCR Teradata, okay? Big company, was actually losing a lot of money at the time, it was part of AT&T, and um, I became a product manager. So product management is the first thing to take away from that, in a place where a lot of people could teach me things, right? They also learned, taught me a lot of th how not to do things, you know, by observation, right? But I got a lot of responsibility early on. I ended up, though, at a startup on the West Coast called Ink to Me, which was the Google before Google. I was already into parallel computing, and so I ended up there, and I ended up creating their caching business, okay? Um, and um, I then went back to grad school, got involved with some startups while I was there. I was on the you know, 50K team for Akamai, could have dropped out, done that. Um, got involved with some others. And um, so as, but I, I'd already left a great startup to go back to school. So I'm like, I'm, fin I'm gonna go through school and then I wanna start something. That was, my, that was my plan. In the spring, start working on some different ideas. And one of my good friends from, from college, I said, you gotta come up here, something's gonna happen. And he had been trading on eBay. Okay, and I'll, I'll, I'll make this much shorter because I can go into it in great detail, but it's, it's, you know, in the interest of time. He was selling some stuff at these prices I couldn't believe, like stuff that you get for free selling for $50 on eBay. And I'm, I'm like, at those prices, I want to sell everything I own. And so we're doing a thought experiment. You know, um, you know we, we look for some objects on there, and the same item would have many different prices. And it's like, well, that's not an efficient market. What if we could capture the prices as, as auctions expire and build a, a price catalog? Right? So imagine a stock market, you didn't know less trade, it wouldn't be very efficient. Right? So we did some analysis, we imagined you know, we had 100 million things in one place that was a canonical catalog of the items sold. And again, it's a thought experiment, it's not an easy thing to do. And then we thought, well, if you're gonna monetize this, something's gotta be three clicks away. Okay? If you take 100 million things though and build a taxonomy of that, you know, and you allow for things to be in more than one place, you quickly find that you'd have to be about 30 levels deep in order to get to an object. And if you say assign a probability of 95%, you pick the right choice each step of the way, it's zero that you ever get there. And at that moment, we, th we realized the problem to solve is how do I type in a concept? In this case, it was Sinatra, right? We look building, we're looking at Sinatra memorabilia and get a Sinatra store instead of a Sinatra list. And basically what we had um, recognized inadvertently is a core challenge of relational databases which is, if you know the perfectly formed question, you can ask that of a database, right? But how does a database give you the relevant questions to ask? So we kind of inverted it, and we had to build the technology to do that. But it turns out, because it was a fundamental database problem, it's the same problem that exists in business intelligence. So it shows up in a bunch of places, okay? By the way, actually, I'm gonna add one thing just before we lose that. What, what Steve just said there was just a perfect example of a story that if you could tell that to an entrepreneur is gonna get them absolutely hooked. Because it was a real world example of something that Steve had experienced with a very real problem that you could instantly see would have huge implications in e-commerce or business intelligence. That's just such a great entrepreneurial instinct that Steve has that I just encourage you to recognize and think about how are you forming your potential opportunity, and how will you tell that story? I hope you don't mind me putting you on the spot like it's that. But, but, but presumably that story, you played that story over and over. <laughs> Until I was blown in the face. Right. So uh, that story for 10 years. There so. you go. And it, it didn't really change, to, even to the end, right? I mean, there was a lot of you know, things along the way, but effectively that's what Oracle bought. Yep, exactly. Oracle bought that story. I probably used that story when they did diligence. Yeah, so it's worth remembering. So. You know, zero to a billion dollars, that was the story. Uh, sorry, question at the back. Sorry. Uh, and this, this is a general question, and this can be for anyone else who's, who's been up in, to speak as well. Um, but talking a little bit more about uh, the human, building the human capital, um, I'm, I'm at a point where I need, I need to, to, to really dig into this, but I'm trying to bootstrap myself. 
how do I convince uh, the people and the right people and find those right people and um, get them to do it for peanuts and equity? Um, okay, so it's your persuasiveness, <laughs> right? Um, the, um, how desperate they are, <laughs> no, I'm just, but I mean, it's, all, it's no different than selling any investor. They're investing their time, okay? Which, is the, which most likely is their scarcest resource. So they gotta believe in the opportunity. They gotta believe in you, okay? You know, how do you sell yourself to them, right? Is your background appropriate for it, right? And sometimes you may not get your A list. It's like you're recruiting a, you know, a baseball team. You may not get your first round draft picks, but can you get a second or third round, right? Make some progress and build up from there, okay? But there's no magic to it. I think it's, 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 you know, the, the best thing you could do is if you've got a few people that might be more credible than you in that particular market because they had specific experience, or maybe you have all the credibility. If you do, then you're not going to have a problem probably getting someone to work with you. But you can get some others to help vouch for the opportunity and help you with that, right? So getting, you know, some friends, advisor types that might be very specific to that market could be very helpful for you. Um, Great question. Go so ahead. I'm just, I'm curious, um, you went through two rounds of, of raising um, and you went through hell and back going through the different economic downturns. What made you say we're going to go acquisition this time? Well, I didn't have another option in those other two times, okay, so, <laughs> um, and I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's as much art as science is to assess, you know, what's the value of what you created? What's the risk in going further? There are a lot of other constituents. You have not only investors, but you have people who invested time over many years, right? And this is an opportunity for them to, you know, have the resources to go start something, you know, that sort of thing. So there's a lot that goes into the calculus, right? There's no simple answer. You know, also, you know, it was preferable to not be a public company as far as I was concerned, right? There's a lot of reasons we could go into on that. It's like almost a whole discussion, but, um, you know, there's no, no one thing I can point to, but having the option gave us the, you know, chance to consider it. I mean, was part of that process also looking out for your people? I mean, it's, it's really, I, I'm very empathetic and sympathetic to that point um, that you, you look out for your people as mm -hmm. much as you look out for the company because they are your company. Yep. And I'm just curious, like, was, I mean, this, it sounds like you went with what would help them and the company survive, but I'm curious, was your going with Oracle the most beneficial deal for your capital, your human capital? The, um, it turns out, I mean, it was, I, 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 the, basically the question was, we had more than one option than Oracle. Was that option going with Oracle also the best for the people at the company, right? And the, it, both options had pros and cons, sure. okay? So it wasn't like a clearly dominant thing, right? I was, uh, pleasantly relieved when we made the announcement and people knew what the other option was, quite a few people came up and said, I'm glad you made this choice. Okay. So that, that felt good. And in the end, you know, I think it was the right choice for, you know, um, for a lot of reasons. Well, just to keep us on time, I'm going to say a very uh, big thank you again to Steve. We really appreciate it. It's absolutely terrific. Um,